Hi there, may my greeting goes to you all. Uh, you are watching Future Africa on OBN Horn of Africa. We are going to discuss the new phase of colonialism, which is neo-colonialism. And I joined by P.D. Lauten from United Kingdom. Uh, basically, she is from South Africa. P.D., good to have you. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. All right. Okay. Uh, let me begin with the first question. Can you exactly uh, tell us the imperialist activity in Africa? Thank you for the question. Um, I think, you know, we are witnessing the very answer to your question with this current situation uh, in Ethiopia and the West's reaction to the issues in, in, in Tigre province and the TPLF and the complete absence of uh, any, any news in the West on the remarkable achievements of completing and filling your grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, as well as the railway from Addis to Djibouti, the high-speed electric railway. So um, really, that, that, that is the answer to your question. That is imperialism and neocolonialism, because nothing that is of any real great importance is ever talked about. All that is ever talked about are these so-called human rights um, and the whole issue of what's happening um, in Tigray province and how the Tigrayans are being used as pawns in, in, a, in, a, in a very old game um, used against uh, the fairly elected Ethiopian government and a government which has achieved the most remarkable changes for Ethiopians uh, that has to be commended. What, what has been happening in Ethiopia is remarkable. It is wonderful. And I would like to say that the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, in all its magnificence, because it is a magnificent uh, project, mega infrastructure, that it is an historical marker for what we can call the new paradigm in Africa. And the new paradigm in Africa, these are momentous times we are living through because we are on the cusp of witnessing monumental changes, monumental shift on the continent of Africa to industrialized economies and to to really, once and for all, alleviate poverty. Poverty is a scourge for Africa. What um, the imperialists, um, who use that term, um, those who cannot see clearly, uh, they continue with a narrative which is becoming um, more and more outdated, obsolete, um, to awakened conscious people, the narrative is completely ridiculous to go on about human rights, um, humanitarian assistance and human rights, uh, when it is the NATO alliance that bombed uh, Libya and destroyed everything that Gaddafi had done and had planned for, for Libya and for the region at large, um, those same people are banging on about human rights in Ethiopia. The hypocrisy has, has reached a level where it is ludicrous. So I don't know how one would really communicate with people like uh, Samantha Powers. Um, is she just a talking head? Or is there anything at all going on in her mind? Um, so, yes, 
That is what I would have to say to your question. Okay, obviously, uh, the prior administration, which was uh, leading the country for about 27 years, uh, was hosted by bitter uprising from Ethiopian people and uh, moved to the capital of the region early. And uh, obviously, the world acknowledged the move of Prime Minister w who succeeded the TPLF's administration uh, has got so many appreciation and uh, he has done uh, so, many, so many initiatives in the country. Uh, so he has also launched so many projects and introduced a homegrown economy. Uh, even he uh, brought uh, the long foy Ethio Ertran case into pieces and the Sudanese case, the Somalia case. He keenly worked on bringing solidarity, regional solidarity in the continent of Africa and in the country as well. But the U.S. government both during the Trump administration and the incumbent uh, Biden's administration, are not willing to accept this uh, words mentioning move of the prime minister. And they rather support and favor the evil doing TPLF. And uh, they are mischieving the world. And uh, US is doing a very, the, the usual hypocrisy that it used to applied in different countries uh, across the world. Why the world failed to understand this hypocrisy of the United States that working vigorously to, I mean, to, to combat the change which is being undergone by the Prime Minister of Ethiopia? What is happening and, and the sanctions on your country and the response to everything that's happening in Tigray, it is nothing other than an attack on development. It is an attack on Ethiopia's position um, in this new paradigm for Africa, and it is an attack on development. That is nothing new. It is such an old story now that we have um, of Africa going back, you know, going back to the 1950s and the 1960s. Um, I think, really, I would say in response to your question, that take, for example, France, um, because the forces of imperialism um, operate through France as well as America. Um, just look to Mali as an example for that <clears throat> but um, we have seen in recent past couple of years the rise of a, a grassroots movement in France called the Gilets Jaunes the Yellow Vests and there are tens of thousands of French people who are so incredibly fed up with the way domestic and foreign policy in France is run. And no matter what government they vote in, you know, whether it's hard, the right Sarkozy or a socialist government of Hollande or, or, or of an outsider, Macron, they have the same policy. So the Yellow Vests have been there and they still are a movement which expresses the Western population's frustration with, uh, with their governments, because no matter who is in power, the policies don't really change. Um, so never mistake uh, the media, the Western media, as being representative of, of what we think in, in our countries, whether they are France or European, Britain, America, because the media is not representative of, um, of what people really think. Why the imperialists, mainly the European Union and the United States of America, become desperate to see a very fragile Ethiopia? And why they uh, 
became against the move that is being undergone by the new administration? I don't think there's anything new in that. I think that the imperialists, the forces of imperialism, the oligarchy, as I like to call them, have been opposed to any form of progress, any form of development, industrialization, for decades, since, since the 50s, since the 60s. Uh, there's nothing new in that attitude. Um, all that it proves is that the oligarchy, um, the oligarchy of imperialism still have a very, a very firm grip on on Western policy um, in Africa. Um, don't forget, we can't just talk about America because there are other countries involved in imperialist actions in Africa. Mm -hmm. um, so does that answer your question? The GERD is a very mega project in Africa as a continent and uh, in Ethiopia in particular, and it, it was really uh, a bone of contention among Sudan, Egypt, and Ethiopia. Uh, we have uh, seen so many controversies, and uh, recently it was made to be tabled by the African Union, and Egypt and Sudan brought the issue to the U.S. and the World Bank, right? In mm. doing all this process, U.S. was infiltrating behind uh, Egypt's government. Why the U.S. became pro-Egypt? I don't know why the, the Egypt did that. I had such faith in um, El Sisi, you know, when they built the new Suez Canal. And um, like you in Ethiopia, you know, the, the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam was entirely funded by Ethiopians. and as was the new Suez Canal, entirely funded by Egyptians. And things seemed so very promising at that point. Um, we don't know what happens behind the scenes. I can imagine that in the case of Sudan, that they are being financially blackmailed. Um, you know, when we talk about the oligarchy, we are talking about a financial system. So it is credit, um, the issuance of credit, and what, A, if, if, if the credit is issued, and B, what the credit is issued for. So in terms of the International Monetary Fund, this is really can be used as a form of manipulation and I think that is probably what is the case of the Sudan. Um, because this country is heavily, heavily in debt. Um, and what is never realized about Sudan is that Sudan had to take on all the debt after the separation um, of the Sudan and South Sudan, the creation of South Sudan in 2010. Um, most unfair. Um, so there's manipulation, financial ma manipulation. That was uh, one of that is one of the most promising things about the the association of BRICS members, um, because there we had I think things have uh, somewhat slipped, um, but we had there the potential for a creation of like a credit system that would work for development. Because what happens with the credit that is issued from the World Bank and the IMF, it is never going into hard infrastructure, always into soft infrastructure. And hard infrastructure is what the entire African continent needs, like the Grand Re uh, Renaissance Dam. Um, hard infrastructure is the greatest uh, humanitarian assistance you can give. So this whole idea, this whole narrative of 
humanitarianism, the hypocrisy that we talked about. Um, the, 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 the thing is that infrastructure is the human right. You know, if you are in most African countries, um, what do you want to talk about? Do you want to talk about your education system or gender equality? Or do you want that railway or that road so you can get your kids to the hospital or to the university? You can put your goods on a, a train and send them somewhere and, and sell them at a good price. You know, um, uh, hard infrastructure is, is, is investing in hard infrastructures being the best friend you can be to Africa, as we see in the case of China. The exploitation of um, African manpower, uh, African resources started uh, early during the era of slave trade, right? And it changed its phase to scramble for Africa as a second phase. Then we have reached on neo-colonialism these days, on the third phase. And how long would Africa uh, be in trouble with changes of phases and uh, entertaining manipulation and exploitation? Until you finish building that railway system. Because that railway system, if your viewers can see the map behind me, that is the African Integrated High Speed Railway Network. And without that railway network, the free trade agreement, which was inaugurated on the 1st of January this year, isn't going to work. But that railway system will be the most revolutionary thing to happen to the entire continent. Um, the exploitation of resources will continue until the network is implemented, until all resources in Africa are um, processed, beneficiation of, of, of the minerals. Um, you know, Ghana's making great gains in uh, implementing that. South Africa under former President Jacob Zuma uh, and the mining charter that he tried to introduce for the beneficiation of South Africa's minerals um, is uh, it's the only way that's ever going to happen. And of course, for the beneficiation of natural resources, for minerals, for value addition, processing and agriculture, as they are doing great guns with in Ghana, you need energy, you need electricity. And that is where the Renaissance Dam comes in because Africa is, suffers from the most acute energy poverty. So your government comes along and you build this magnificent dam which is now full and capable by the end of the year of running the turbines to produce electricity to generate power and power is is how, how you need electricity you need energy to run manufacturing plants it's not complicated so why the West, I mean, we must just appeal to the more reasoned minds of policymakers and explain to them that if you are really a true friend of Africa, then invest in the hard infrastructure, help African governments to build um, power projects to produce electricity, to start manufacturing on a, on a, on a massive scale. But of course, the oligarchy don't want that because they already control all of um, exported uh, raw resources and they have done so since the year dot. The hypocrisy of the U.S. is endless always and the U.S. is there when there is rebel which resists the central government. The same is happening in Ethiopia. Instead of standing with the majority of the people of Ethiopia, the U.S. preferred to stand beside the rebel TPLF, right? And obviously TPLF was delegated by the U.S. as a puppet administration 
which is used to dismantle the Horn region for 27 years. And uh, they are still backing up this rebel group and uh, they are still downgrading the work is being undergone by the federal government, which is headed by Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed. Obviously, the Prime Minister got his legitimacy uh, by popular vote, which was held before two months. Uh, almost he won the election in landslides. But still, the U.S. is resisting this positive and promising move of the Prime Minister. And wh what do you say about this? That that's what the oligarchy do. They, they back minority groups. Um, that is just a pattern, it's their it's a tactic. They, they back mi minority groups in order to be for them to become a destabilizing force to destabilize a country or a region um, and ultimately to bring about regime change um, or make a country or a region ungovernable so that is that is simply what they do this this has happened in so many so many countries in Africa and not just Africa it happens in Central and South America it's happened in Syria um, when um, America backed the, they called them the uh, moderate rebels. So, you know, this is, a, this is something that has got to end. We hoped for a while under President Trump um, because he said that uh, the regime change, change operations run by America must end. Um, so really backing minority groups is just one of those tactics. Still, the U.S. is yelling about the humanitarian crisis in Tigray Regional State, right? This was not the first one in the history of the continent Africa, and it has been happening during their regime, and they used to uh, bury people alive in jail Ogaden, and they tortured, massacred, perpetrated, and so many uh, public figures were uh, lost and found still. But that time, the U.S. never uttered any single voice which uh, talks about the humanitarian crisis and human rights violation. Why this time U.S. is yelling and screaming out loud about the humanitarian crisis? And why the U.S. desperate to forcefully subjugate the very legitimate government of the country this time around? If I might uh, answer your question by going back in history to Angola in the 1970s. And uh, in the 1970s, Agostino Neto, who turned the coin a luta continua, uh, was the leader against the colonial occupation of Angola. And he, he was the head of the movement called the MPLA. Now, one could safely say that probably 70 to 80 percent, if not higher, of Angolans were behind Agostino Neto. And uh, then along came um, a very brave man called John Stockwell, and he was a task officer stationed in Angola. Um, he worked for the CIA, and he wrote a book um, called In Search of Enemies, which anyone can buy. It is available. Unfortunately, all the money goes to the CIA because um, they, uh, they, they, they got John Stockwell on those grounds. Um, but he very bravely wrote down his memoirs. And so you had a situation in Angola in the 70s where this was a wonderful moment when colonialism, the colonialists had left, the Portuguese had left, and uh, the country was to move forward, very unite, united. And John Stockwell was given the task as a CIA officer of forming a rebel group. 
which turned out to be the FNLA. The FNLA, before the CIA poured money into them, were a band of nothing. And um, the money was channeled in, and the, the arms were channeled in through uh, Mobutu Sese Siko's DRC, mm -hmm. Zaire, mm -hmm. now DRC. And to get the American public uh, to, to back uh, the um, American backing of the FNLA, they ran propag propaganda programs of how terrible um, the government of Agostino Neto was and the, the atrocities and the crimes and how the MPLA were just a, um, a, a communist uh, force being operated from Moscow. You see, this is, was not even logical because these were Angolans um, achieving liberation. Um, but they really went to town and they ran this massive propaganda campaign. So you had Americans who knew, who didn't even know where Angola was. And they were all signing up to go and, to go and fight the communists, to go and fight against the MPLA. So uh, that, that little story, which is so very well documented by John Stockwell, a tremendously brave man, um, that answers your question. It is a, it is a repeat, it is the pattern. In the name of humanitarian crisis, again, the U.S. is infiltrating into, into Ethiopia's case this time, and they, they seem uh, that they are seeking a regime change. But no time in history, a government who has got full support from its public wouldn't be forcefully subjugated or hosted. And today, even at the epicenter of the capital of Ethiopia, uh, so many people were shown up and demonstrated their support to the new administration and to the military. Uh, why the U.S. failed to know this? The people are with, with, with the current administration, the incumbent government. Yes, well, we saw the same in Syria. You know, I think 87% of Syrians voted for Assad, and yet he was portrayed as a monster. The same with Gaddafi, he was portrayed as a madman. And we saw it most recently with one of the smallest countries in Africa, in Burundi. And uh, the Burundi is a very, very small country geographically. Exactly. And yeah. under the presidency of a, a great, a great leader, um, he died um, a few months ago, sadly, Pia Nkurunziza. Mm -hmm. The uh, regime change operation was uh, inflicted on Burundi. And I think, I do believe Burundi is still under sanctions from the US. This is one of the poorest countries in the world under sanctions, like you yourselves are. Ethiopia is under sanction. Um, economic sanctions are a form of masked, uh, it's a masked, masked economic war. Um, so it happened in, in Burundi in 2015, 2016 under the same false allegations. Um, and the situation of the corridor, the humanitarian corridor, um, I believe that um, your government has, has specified which corridors can be used to bring in the aid and the, the, the TPLF have, have made the situation so much worse because they have been blocking aid. Well, in Burundi, the um, government later said that arms were being funneled. They were being they were using the UN vehicles to get arms through to the uh, rebel group that were uh, opposing um, the administration of Pierre Incurenziza. So, and this has happened in Syria. So, um, unfortunately, the you know, we come back to the media 
And um, if we go back once again in history to the time of Cecil John Rhodes, um, an arch imperialist, he was uh, the Prime Minister of South Africa, Rhodesia was the name of um, Zimbabwe. Rhodesia was named after Cecil John Rhodes. Luckily, they changed the name. Um, but he wrote uh, back in 1900, he said this was be, we'd be a very, very wealthy man and he wanted to buy the Cape Argos, which was the biggest newspaper in South Africa. And he said, we must own um, the Cape Argos. We must, um, we must control and own the media, the press, because the, it is the press that rules, rules the minds of men. So um, there is an issue of the media and how controlled um, the media actually is. P.D. Lawton, an independent journalist from UK, uh, thank you for your precious time and thank you for your scholarly insight about the ongoing neocolonialism and uh, the U.S. intervention in Africa and in Ethiopia this time around. Thank you once again. Thank you for having me. All right. Dear viewers, once again, thank you for joining us. Uh, you've been watching uh, our discussion on the current situation in Ethiopia and uh, the neocolonialism trade in Africa. Uh, thank you for watching. Bye-bye. Have a good one.